What is respiratory reflux? I'm Dr. Jamie Kaufman, and and I am respiratory reflux. <laughs> it's my career. It's my life. Um, I've spent, uh, I would say, in excess of hundreds of thousands of hours over the course of my last 40 or 50 years de developing um, the concept of respiratory reflux, which is very counter to our current uh, medical mainstream. So by definition, uh, really all this means is acid reflux that comes into the respiratory system. In 1987, I coined the term uh, LPR, laryngopharyngeal reflux, reflux in the larynx and pharynx, because I was a laryngologist, mostly interested in laryngeal complications. But as time passed, it became clear that this was not enough, it was not comprehensive enough, it was hard to pronounce. So what about reflux into the, into the lung? What, what about reflux in the sinuses, the ears? What about all of the structures of the respiratory system? Once reflux is in the throat, which is essentially uh, ground zero for respiratory reflux, uh, then it can go anywhere within the respiratory system. Here's the thing, respiratory reflux can cause virtually all respiratory diseases and or um, accelerate them. For example, you don't want to have um, a, a COPD um, and reflux because the reflux will accelerate uh, the COPD even if you stop smoking 25 years ago. So reflux that comes into the throat and ends up in the respiratory tract is respiratory reflux. Uh, a few small points. Uh, the lining membrane of the respiratory tract is mucous membranes. So with irritation, you get um, mucus and it's thick mucus. So the easy differentiation, for example, from allergy and um, reflux is that it's very thin mucus with allergy, other signs and symptoms of allergy, puffy eyes, itchy sneezing, nasal congestion. Um, allergies, uh, very, very thin, clear mucus never gets on the vocal cords to cause problems. The thick white mucus that you see from top to bottom of the pharynx and in the larynx, uh, that's reflux. And to my uh, uh, way of thinking and my experience, there's no other cause. So there's not a disease that causes, causes post-nasal drip. So those of you who say, oh, my reflux is doing great, but I still have post-nasal drip, the answer is you still have reflux. Maybe it's better. After the 1987 term came along, um, there was real pushback from the gastroenterologist. Gastroenterologists didn't want to use my term, uh, even though I published uh, a lot. I've told you in the past, I put together a five-year plan um, in 1987. Uh, that to look at all aspects of respiratory reflux, everything from epidemiology to basic science, cell biology, and so on. And it took 15 years to do it. Um, much of the cell biology um, has not been read by anybody because otolaryngologists don't read basic science and gastroenterologists and such don't read otolaryngology literature. In any case, the work has been done and the work is summarized in many ways uh, in, in a usable form in the book Dropping Acid, uh, which was the first time, in my opinion, that the, uh, you had uh, reflux, diet, and cure all in the same sentence. So respiratory reflux is huge. Americans tend to eat late. They tend to make the evening meal the major refueling meal of the day. Uh, they tend to snack. They tend to have alcohol in the evening. And so they have respiratory reflux, but it's not any kind of respiratory reflux. It's silent nighttime respiratory reflux. So imagine when you lie down, what's in your stomach is in your esophagus, is in your throat, maybe it just sits in a small puddle there all night, and you wake up in the morning and your voice is hoarse and you're coughing up a little bit of stuff, and um, you have other symptoms in the post-nasal drip, and uh, the clearing everything out in the morning is, is an issue. So respiratory reflux uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to diagnose for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's, it's for most people, I'm talking here 95 percent, it, it's silent nighttime respiratory reflux. So if you sleep through it, uh, then you don't know you have it because you don't have heartburn or indigestion during the day. Sort of the telltale symptoms of, of gastroesophageal reflux disease belongs to the 
a gastro a gastroenterologist. So respiratory reflux is um, not easy to diagnose. And, um, and furthermore, your doctor doesn't know how to diagnose it. This is ignorant as could be because the gastroenterologists are interested in looking at the scope and making a lot of money doing endoscopies and have not progressed um, uh, any of the, uh, how shall I say, science in the last 60 years. Um, I know all the opinion leaders in gastroenterology and they all know my work. And my uh, uh, work on respiratory reflux essentially threatens uh, the, the gastroenterology, the GI heartburn model. So reflux is not about heartburn, it's not about indigestion. What is it about? Uh, Post-nasal drip, a sensation of a lump in the throat, chronic throat clearing, a chronic cough, a shortness of breath, asthma-like symptoms, wheezing. And so any part, inclu including your symptoms, uh, a popping, fullness, tinnitus, so all the symptoms that can be had, um, I've seen in my practice over the course of my lifetime, 100,000 or more patients with this. Now, the thing that makes me special, you know, one of the things, is that uh, in 1981, I began looking at reflux into the throat with technology that proved it. So we put pH monitoring catheters in the throat starting in 81. And in 87, I had my own pH testing laboratory. And at that time, we were already getting custom made um, pH catheters. We had all different lengths, so we'd get it right. But the best pH chip money could buy, ISFET. Buy an expensive pH media had an ISFET chip. That's what we put in the throat. So I have this data for, 10,000, 20,000, who knows how many patients who've had reflux testing of this type that proves it. And then I could look at the larynx and say, ooh, these findings go with that kind of uh, test results. But here's the problem. Right now, there is no test for respiratory reflux. The GI tests are worthless. So if you have a Bravo and it's normal, it means nothing. If you have impedance and it's normal, it means nothing. If you have a ResTech uh, test and it's normal, it means nothing. So the answer is there's nobody in the, t any, anybody has any technology that actually proves and looks at the pattern of reflux in the throat um, or, uh, if you will, uh, respiratory reflux uh, testing. Now, the reason for that is that the reimbursement for Medicare is so low, it's not worth doing. You have to buy the equipment, you have to train somebody to do it, the patients have to wear the things overnight, you have to pay for, 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 for disposables. Um, so, you know, when I was in private practice, it wasn't a problem, I charged a little extra. But the reality is there's no good reflux testing now. By the way, all of this has been sabotaged by gastroenterology. So the professional fee is nothing, but there's a good facility fee. Well, they own facilities, but I don't own a facility. I do this in my office. So you get paid $119 and the facility fee is, and who knows what, over 1000 So the, there's a lot of conflict and there's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of unethical behavior involved in a reflux and reflux testing. And I'll leave it at that. Now, we will go back to respiratory reflux. <clears throat> the respiratory tract is more sensitive than the esophagus. Um, we did the studies that show that you can get tissue damage at pH 4 or less um, in the esophagus. And, and generally speaking, uh, stomach acid is 0 to 4. Um, and by the way, lemons 2.7, uh, so are many soda drinks. So by law, everything has to be acidified. So no soft drinks, nothing out of a bottle or a can. So we have this problem where the patient doesn't know they have it. You don't know you have it. And the doctor doesn't know you have it. So you're treating asthma that isn't asthma, you're treating sinus disease that isn't sinus disease, and many of you are having unnecessary sinus surgery, um, get a look at your, at your examination, your results. If you have mucoperiosteal thickening, that's this thick lining, that, that's not chronic sinusitis, that's reflux, you don't need surgery. So the big question is, what do we do? And the answer is, it's cultural, it's cultural, it's cultural. Uh, we spend a trillion dollars a year on uh, uh, fast food, a trillion, okay? A 30% of America's diet is fast food. So we spend a trillion dollars to get reflux, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, 
all of the epidemics of our time are due to the way we eat, and there's nothing you can do about that with a pill or a procedure. And um, then we spend another trillion dollars, the healthcare system, with procedures and uh, treatments that don't work. For example, 0% of people get well on proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec and Nexium. So we got a problem. Um, uh, 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 venture capitalists want to make money. Um, you may be shocked to know that there are 907,000 companies um, involved in healthcare, and I'm betting every single one of them wants to make a profit. So all these devices, people ask me about them, the new one comes from Sweden, the, the, the links, they're, they're all terrible, they all don't do anything. And it gets back now to the big question. Respiratory reflux probably affects at least three quarters of you who are listening to this, and at least three quarters of people in America, adults. Um, it happens at night while you sleep, and then you have all these problems. Interesting that snoring and sleep apnea have skyrocketed. We didn't even hear of anything like that when I went into practice. Um, in the 70s, snoring and sleep apnea wasn't a thing. Um, in my opinion, based upon examining uh, hundreds of patients with it, you can examine if somebody says, ooh, you have snoring and sleep apnea, don't you? And they go, oh yeah, I wear one of those machines. And the answer is you have to have silent nocturnal respiratory reflux for 20 years to get snoring and sleep apnea. Um, if you have snoring and sleep apnea or it's respiratory reflux long-standing, you ought to have a bed that goes up high. You ought to eat uh, uh, no closer than four hours to bedtime. You ought to take a Gaviscon advance and you ought to look at the elements of my detox diet and, um, and, and go from there. Um, so we're having trouble diagnosing it. I can diagnose it, but I'm not in practice. And uh, I may put up a blog, a medical blog, up soon, which is basically these are the findings of nighttime reflux. The number one finding is the back of the voice box is so swollen that it's touching the back wall of the throat. That's called post edema. That's the universal sign of, of nighttime reflux. And the other is the vocal cords are swollen. So respiratory reflux, and, and, and by the way, the, the uh, reflux symptom index is on many of my posts. Um, it asks the questions about everything from, uh, you know, cough and post-nasal drip and, and so on. If you ask the number of patients that I have, um, which is a, a massive number, how many of them have heartburn? Most of them say never had heartburn. Occasionally some will say, oh, I have heartburn once or twice a week or a month. So this is a silent reflux from that point of view as well. Now, with all that said, <laughs> Here comes the hard part. Remember I said reflux was not a medical condition. It's diet and lifestyle. Remember I said 100 million of you have it, okay? All you people who have, you know, sinus problems and facial uh, pressure and post-nasal, I mean, all the symptoms, you know them. They're, they're all basic, most common respiratory symptoms. And, and by the way, 80% uh, 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 of people with asthma don't have asthma. If you have trouble breathing in during an asthma attack, it's not asthma. So we have this massive number of people. So the question comes is then what's next? The answer is in the future, we're going to train doctors or primary care physicians, assistants, uh, PAs, nurse practitioners to practice integrated air resistive medicine. And they'll know what I know. We'll put together a curriculum. And so you'll see one doctor for post-nasal drip, you'll see one doctor for, for, for reflux, for sinusitis, for a, a chronic cough, for, 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 for ear problems, and so on. For all of the aerodigestive, and this week I put up a blog, what is the aerodigestive tract? And the answer is the respiratory system and digestive system are one. They're attached anatomically, physiologically, and neurologically. It's one system. So by breaking up the body in little boxes, it doesn't work. So the, the real issue is to take a group of people and train them in integrated air digestive medicine, teach them how to do the endoscopies, uh, get into Medicare and get re good reimbursement. And then here comes the big piece. After the diagnosis is made, you're then going to see a, a dietary consultant, not a dietitian. As far as I'm concerned, they can have a BA in uh, uh, art. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and you take a college student and teach him or her 
that you can't drink soda pop and here's why. Um, you can't eat too close to bed and here's why. And so then you can sit and talk with a, 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 a if you will, a, a healthcare professional who um, has, an, has time for, for you for an hour. And maybe they even have uh, the ability to text. So you can ask a, sec- a question, I'm coming off detox now, um, can I um, eat nuts, which nuts? So, and by the way, that's the pearl of the week. If you haven't noticed, I'm starting to put a pearl of the week at the bottom. JamieKaufman.com um, is my most up-to-date stuff, and it really forms the backbone of my new book, Respiratory Reflux, How Silent Reflux Causes um, Disease. Now, um, I can't belong, I mean, I can't go through more details except to say um, many of you are going to have to be the captain of your own ship. Obviously, I broke a hip. The captain of my ship was my orthopedist. But if you have post-nasal drip, you're the captain of your ship. Okay, if you have a lump in the throat, you're captain of your ship. And you're going to teach your primary care physician too. You're going to ask for a barium swallow esophagram, upright and supine, standing and lying down um, at some point after treatment to see if you still have reflux and to what degree. What degree do you have esophageal dysfunction? Does the upper valve work? So the point is that uh, there's a big problem and it's not easy to diagnose and treat. I'm not going to say more about it today, but I shall. And I want to just uh, make a comment. Since it's all about diet and lifestyle, people keep asking me to have a whole session on food. The problem with reflux is that everybody's different. So, for example, my trigger foods were um, a green pepper, chocolate, um, a, a, a uncooked onion, and um, a white wine. Just a little bit, and it sent me off into reflux. So, what I'm saying to you is there's so much variation that you're going to have to educate yourself. I strongly recommend that you act like a medical student and look at jamiekaufman.com with the idea that you're going to spend enough time, maybe an hour or two hours a day for a week or so. If you do that, um, you will not only be able to help yourself and your family, but you'll know more about reflux than 99% of the physicians in America. So today we live with uh, respiratory reflux. I feel a little bit like an outlier, which is just fine. Um, The whole world thinks the world is flat, the medical world, and I'm telling them it's round. So there's going to have to be restructuring of of specialists. They have to be restructuring and and repricing within within, uh, Medicare. So now I'd like to answer some questions. And I'd like a couple of comments about questions. I want to reiterate again that um, so many of these questions are, are idiosyncratic. For example... Um, when I went, I love apples. When I went back to eating apples after my detox, when I had reflux, um, I used to eat Red Delicious as a kid. I loved them. And Red Delicious gave me reflux, but Fuji's didn't. So I've become a Fuji fanatic. I go to play golf. I cut them up in little pieces, take the baggie with me. Um, I also have my own alkaline water. Um, and I read, there are three articles on alkaline water. I think I'm going to write a fourth that summarizes everything. Um, and there are a lot of little tricks in alkaline water. Um, uh, here's one for smoothies. Uh, put your alkaline water in here and add it with your almond milk and so on. So uh, the questions um, uh, about food are difficult because they, they're not universal. Second, make the questions shorter. So I don't look at your questions over the course of the month. My assistant basically calls them and puts them on a piece of paper you know, that, 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 look, that looks like this, that's six pages long. And I have questions that are more than a half a page long. So keep your questions short. For example, the last one I'm going to answer has to do with, with, with histamine uh, intolerance and um, how little I know about it, but, but, some, but a few things. So try to make the, answer, the, the questions shorter. And um, I don't know everything. So many of the things that I've learned over the course of my uh, career as a physician, I've learned from patients. And I've listened to patients. And not only have I listened to patients, I've asked patients. I, I ask questions like, by the way, do you have any trigger foods? What are they? I've asked patients. And that is after they're on treatment. At the beginning, people think everything's a trigger food. So, so much of what I've learned, here's an example of a really cool thing. Um, a water company called Evermore in St. 
uh, in uh, New Orleans, uh, the head guy called me and said, you know, some people are telling us that our water takes away their heartburn. So I thought about it, I understood uh, pepsin, you need to understand. If you've never read the article, What is Pepsin, on my blog, please do so. Um, anyway, I said, this is really a good idea. So we went in the laboratory and we tested it, and sure enough, um, alkaline water, pH 8.8, .8, uh, kills pepsin. Personally, I recommend 9.5 these days, although I would avoid uh, 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 Essentia. Um, I don't like seeing phosphates added. In any case, um, we, we have uh, questions that are, that are a little bit complex today, but I'm going to do the best I can with them. So, this is a good question. This is a person whose iron is low and asked me to discuss the safest sources of iron um, the answer is good news, ferrous gluconate. Those pills are fine. I don't care if you eat eight of them a day. Um, they're sold online. I don't know which brands are good and safe and best, um, but um, you might ask your physician about uh, prescribing ferrous gluconate, and then you get um, prescription grade. Um, in terms of foods, um, a very funny thing, I went back to being vegan. I wanted to calculate so I get 45 grams of protein a day and it was hard. It's not a lot of protein in broccoli, it's a lot of other stuff. And not a lot of, not a lot of protein in rice, it's not, but, I, but, but, but I was in my cupboard. And by the way, I'm a chegan, a cheating vegan. So I went in my cupboard and I looked at my sardines and to my surprise there were 26 grams of protein in that little can of sardines. I don't care, I don't remember if it was in oil or water. Uh, but I toasted up a piece of bread and I threw them in there. Um, and uh, uh, that was 26 grams of protein, 45 is all you need. So you see, you have to educate yourself. That gets me my last point of, if you will, critique, is many of the questions you're asking me um, are, are, are available online. They may not be, don't, you don't have to buy everything, you may have to check it, but you can check, for example, which foods are, are high in histamine. You can check which foods um, are, are the most common trigger foods in my work and others. So many of many of the questions you have are the resources are available. So uh, iron person, ferrous gluconate, um, oysters are great, sardines are great, and if you go and list uh, uh, Google uh, the highest uh, um, uh, uh, iron containing foods, you'll get a list and you want to avoid the ones that are refluxy. <clears throat> Next question is, um, how is burping connected with respiratory reflux? And do you have any suggestions when you have a nighttime episode of gasping for breath? Um, there's not a name next to this. Yes, there is. Nyla. Nyla, if you wake up in the, in the middle of the night gasping for air like a fish out of water, you now move into the championship division of silent nocturnal respiratory reflux. By the way, the, the new acronym is cool. It's S-N little O-R-R, -R, capital, everything's capitalized except O, S-N-O-R-R, -R, snore. And so you're, you, 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 whatever you think you're doing to treat your reflux, you're doing a bad job. So first of all, refluxing um, can come in many forms and burping is um, an aerosolized version. The valve opens and up comes stuff. Um, and the nighttime episode of gasping for breath, it's scary. Um, so you ought to be not eating within five hours of bed. You ought to be sleeping on a high incline. You ought to be taking Fomotidine, Gaviscon Advance, and be eating a low-fat, low-acid diet. Nothing out of a bottle or a can. Um, uh, you can have water, tea, coffee, uh, the, the, the caffeine ones in moderation. This is an unusual question, and I'll just answer it as best I can. Um, I'm extremely bloated while in the healing phase of alkaline diet with alkaline water. Okay, so alkaline water doesn't do anything. Okay, it's water. There are no side effects of alkaline water. Zero, nil, never is, never will be. It's water. Okay? If you have a side effect to, to water, um, which nobody does, then, then that, that would make, that would cut. Now, one of the things that we never talk about are there different types of triggers. Number one is I eat a piece of chocolate and I'm refluxing like a bandit within 10 minutes. That's a reflux trigger. Number two, I have neurogenic and reflux related cough. And when I eat black pepper, it feels like there's a hot pepper there, even if I don't have reflux and I cough with black pepper. I still don't eat black, black pepper, by the way. And, but I can eat red pepper, different chemicals. Well, who knows? What's well, not just capsaicin? 
So um, the third type of, um, if you will, trigger, and that was my green pepper, uh, bell pepper. Some foods, the stomach goes, I'm not doing this. And it essentially causes, um, uh, if you will, gastroparesis or slow stomach, which certainly contributes to acid reflux and respiratory reflux too. So if you're having a bloated stomach, you need to start doing an elimination diet and seeing uh, if there are foods that are producing this within your diet that you think are otherwise safe. Six months after on the diet, Corey says, I feel so much better, but I still have to clear my throat all the time. Well, chronic throat clearing is the last thing to go if you're doing a good job. Um, maybe you still have reflux. Um, and furthermore, it's worse during the winter. You may have to wait till spring because <laughs> We get baked and all of our mucus gets thick and hard to mute. Uh, I've given up trying to do the, uh, the the thing that puts out the humidity all the time in my bedroom. But um, it, may be, it may take several more months. Um, but the other question is, maybe your treatment isn't as tight as you think. Maybe you're, and by the way, you only have to reflux a few times a month. Let's just say every other week plus um, to keep um, thick, Post nasal drip going. So this gets back to that question: Is it possible to make a list um, of all the foods, um, especially the stuff that's been covered? Um, other than the detox diet, uh, Dr. Kaufman's acid reflux diet, which is the second book that uh, goes with uh, uh, dropping acid, addresses um, transition, but. If you're in a detox program, at the end of the detox, you can't just go back to normal. You change one thing at a time. I'm getting close to the end. You only change one thing at a time. You don't like sleeping high? Go down low. Stay there for a few few nights. Oh, is the reflux coming back? Wake up in the morning? Hmm, then you need to buy a bed that goes up and down. Or for me, the first thing I wanted is more fruits. All the fruits and all the vegetables, acidity is listed on, an, on, an, on a blog, on a post. And... Um, I'm a big, big, big fan of, of uh, um, pears and apples. Um, um, and I never liked citrus, which is good, because for those of you who like citrus, it's no good for refluxes. You might as well be drinking stomach acid. So, um, by the way, the bloated person wants to know, can Beano and Gas X be taken? And the answer is absolutely yes. This one's funny. I like this one a lot. Is there a tiny bit of chocolate one can have before it hits the threshold, causing a serotonin surge and relaxing the... Uh, so it, it's actually theobromine. Um, how big is that piece of chocolate? And the answer is no chocolate. If your reflux is out of control, um, certainly um, of the trigger foods, alcohol is number one and chocolate is pretty close to number two in terms of universal trigger foods. Um, it's high fat, and um, the milk chocolate is worse than you asked about, and uh, 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 caffeine and theobromine. So, um, sorry, but for you chocolate lovers, get your reflux fixed. I mean, I don't have reflux anymore, and I eat it. Um, i got to tell you, those uh, um, uh, Giardelli milk chocolate squares with the caramels are just uh, to die for. Um, I'm not going to address this question, but I want to bring it up. I have no reflux, but burning when speaking and swallowing. Currently on 2100 of gabapentin and 10 milligrams of amitriptyline daily. Symptoms have slightly improved. You need a bigger dose. So if your doctor doesn't want to give you a bigger dose, ask why. There's a reason why. When you think about gabapentin, this is a treatment. By the way, there's an article on three things I treat neurogenic. A burning throat, voice use pain, and neurogenic cough. That's it. All the rest of you have had little vagal neuropathies. Forget about it. You don't need treatment. Get your reflux fixed. Um, I told the story before, but I had a small woman with burning throat who otherwise had had three unnecessary surgeries and a lot of chaos uh, delivered by the healthcare system, who ended up uh, getting relief with 8,000 milligrams a day. So uh, she took 1,600 five times a day. I think that computes. So the answer is, there's a reason why they make a 100 milligram and an 800 milligram pill and the ones in between, because the doses are different. Maybe it's just how they're absorbed, the bioavailability. So, you know, you may you probably need to go up to 2400 and see how you do. And uh, you say you're having mild side effects, but you actually um, don't talk about what that is. So, 
By the way, muscle tension dysphonia and voice therapy. Whew. It's overprescribed. Um, there's a doctor friend of mine who's a laryngologist, takes over voice problems. And when you book him, you have to book to see him and the speech pathologist the next appointment. Um, that may make more money for people, but it doesn't take care of people very well. In my opinion, there's specific indications uh, for voice therapy and um, having these kind of symptoms that you have, the burning and the um, voice use pain, those are neurogenic. So um, the last question I'm going to address, because I'm right at overtime, is how do I taper off Pepsid? Um, I have rebound hyperacidity when I come off Pepsid. I, I will tell you that I've put no less than, I don't know, 25,000 people on uh, uh, the, the, the famotidine, the generic Pepsid. And if you look at my article on pregnancy, we've been using it in, in pregnant women for 25 years. So it's the most effective and safest medicine we have pretty much. Um, and it's great for reflux. But I've never heard of rebound before. That said, if you're really well and you want to taper it, the way I recommend tapering it is taper one pill a week. So you go from four to three, or even you can do one a month, the two to one, and the last one that goes is the one before bed. So um, that's how you taper uh, slowly rather than all at once. Um, and I think the um, question if I'm back to, to new symptoms and this, this up and down is your reflux is still not completely under control, meaning your lower esophageal sphincter is nice and tight and working well and uninflamed, and so does the rest of the system. So if you haven't seen uh, the, the post um, on the aerodigestive tract, um, it's actually an important one. I just put it up this week, and um, I recommend you also sign up for the blog, put your email in, and each week you'll get a... Um, email telling you the topic. If it interests you, you can open it or save it. If it doesn't interest you, you close, you delete the email. But uh, that, that gets me to my, my, my big issue, which is um, I've spent a lot of money on a website to try to get it right, try to reach more people, to do SEO. I mean, the amount of money I've spent um, is about as much money as I earn. So, I mean, I've spent a lot of money on it. And I ask myself, why don't I have a million people hitting my website a day? There's no other content like it anywhere in the world. Um, the best article on the vagus nerve ever written. There's nothing. All the other articles about, let's do these exercises and maybe a little um, anomalous. So, you know, the, the answer to the question is uh, that I've written a book for you on the blog. Tell, you, tell your friends about it. Um, get people to sign up. Same thing uh, uh, for, for this Facebook Live, that I'm interested in reaching as many people as possible. I'm 76 years old, my health isn't great, my work is important, and I'd like your help. So, with that, adieu.